Welcome to section 2.24 where we're going to talk about chemosynthesis. So before we get to cellular respiration, uh, we still have one more process that can build things, that can build organic compounds. So if we're going to make food or stuff that's used for storage or structure, those are all organic compounds in our bodies like lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, you've got to use some form of synthesis. Photosynthesis is the normal one, but there's going to be some of these more odd ways called chemosynthesis where we're going to use some type of chemical. Now a common place you'll see this will be these hydrothermal vents, so areas where like water is superheated because there's volcanic activity near there, and it allows for air and water to essentially escape. And so they can be two different colors. This here is a white smoker. Uh, what that means is a lot of the gases that are being given off here uh, and a lot of the compounds will tend to be based on like calcium or barium, stuff that if you look at, it looked light colored. Uh, whereas if you see a black smoker, it looked like it's more this black plume that's going in the water. This is all underwater. Uh, and the black plumes tend to be based upon sulfur. So that usually has hydrogen sulfide, which is a rotten egg smell. If you've ever, ever been around a rotten egg, uh, it's that kind of nasty rotten egg smell you get. That's hydrogen sulfide. So this will be one of the places you'll find chemosynthesis is typically around these smokers. And it depends upon which type of smoker as to whether or not you will find guys that can actually do synthesis with these chemicals or, or which guys specifically you will find. Because there are a couple different versions of chemosynthesis. So why do this? We have a lot of guys that live very, 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 very deep in the ocean where there pretty much is no light. So photosynthesis is an absolute no-go. Now you could live trying to feed upon scraps of things that you know were able to be fed by algae and things that are in the light from at the surface of the water. Some of those things can die and fall down. So you could try to feed upon detritus, the, the waste, the leftovers, the dead organisms. But there are some organisms that have found niches, places where they can live, and they can actually make their own food even in the absence of light. And this is a huge deal if you're one of those organisms that can, you know, A, do chemosynthesis, or B, you're around someone who can do chemosynthesis because you have a reliable food source. You have a reliable ability to make your own food or to eat or borrow food from somebody else so that you can live. And the other reason you get this is because some of them have evolved it. So as simple as that seems, uh, when we look at kind of the evolution of organisms, sometimes we get where through a series of perhaps lucky mutations and then selection, we've gotten where some of these traits have evolved and once they did, it was awesome. So because chemosynthesis, because some organisms managed to take inorganic chemicals, so not these big carbon-based ones, but these smaller ones that aren't necessarily even carbon-based, because they managed to take and extract energy from them to build food, they lived, they did well. And because that was an awesome thing, other organisms evolved to adapt to either work with those guys mutualistically to share food or essentially to eat those guys because it was an available food source. And so once this happened, then everything else just kind of follows naturally. And so if we did not get chemosynthesis to evolve, then obviously we wouldn't be discussing this. But because it did manage that some of these enzymes worked for it, it's something we have to discuss, uh, especially if we use these theoretical scenarios where the sun goes out and light's gone we can still discuss the fact that some guys could still live. Now when we talk about chemosynthetic guys, we tend to focus and bring up a lot extremophiles. So these are guys that tend to like conditions that would kill most organisms. So they like it where it's too hot, like the hydrothermal vents, where it can be exceedingly hot, in some cases hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they might like conditions that are extremely salty, extremely acidic. For our purposes with chemosynthesis, we'll see a lot of places that do chemosynthesis will be really hot. So you've got things like the Pompeii worm uh, can survive at over 175 degrees Fahrenheit. There's not very many organisms, if any, that can survive those temperatures. So these guys ultimately live mutualistically. They've got bacteria that grow on them, and they live mutualistically with these bacteria. But because these hydrothermal vents are hot, if you're going to take advantage of this chemosynthetic opportunity, this energy source, you have to be able to tolerate the conditions. So luckily for them, organisms have evolved to be able to tolerate high heat. Organisms have evolved to manage to do chemosynthesis and mixing those, we manage to get organisms that can do chemosynthesis in these extremely hot environments. We'll also see other chemosynthetic environments can be ones that have really high methane amounts, uh, certain swamps and such, high ammonia amounts, 
So they tend to have a lot of chemicals that would mess us up, that would kill us potentially. But if you're gonna do chemosynthesis, these organisms actually represent an opportunity. There's energy in these chemicals. And so if you can manage to access the energy in those chemicals, you can make your own food and you can actually thrive in conditions that would kill most other organisms. Uh, so what is chemosynthesis? I'm gonna give you one example. This is hydrogen sulfide chemosynthesis. So H2S is hydrogen sulfide. If you see someone mention that compound like I have, uh, that's what they're talking about. And so this occurs with those black smokers typically. And so it will take carbon dioxide, oxygen, and hydrogen sulfide. And using the hydrogen sulfide to provide much of the energy, it's going to allow it to make simple sugar. CH2O, if you remember, is just the basic format for the simplest sugars. And then we're going to have sulfur and water given off as our byproducts. Those are going to be the other products that we produce. There's many other ways of doing this. Uh, you're all gonna, they're all going to have to have a carbon source, but that can be either CO2 or in some cases they'll use methane. And they're all going to have to have an energy source, which is commonly H2S. It could be hydrogen gas in some cases. Uh, I believe there might be a couple actually that use methane for this. I'm, I'd have to double check myself. Uh, and you've got some that can use ammonia. So it's not like chemosynthesis has only evolved one time to do one thing. Uh, it appears as though this has happened multiple times using different inorganic chemicals to allow this process to occur. But all of them will share in common that they have to have some source of carbon and they've got to have some source of actual energy that replaces the light that we talked about in photosynthesis. So we had CO2 in photosynthesis for carbon, we had light for energy. In this case, we've got H2S providing energy and CO2 providing the carbon. And that wraps up chemosynthesis. So we're going to pick up a cell respiration after this. I hope you guys enjoyed it.